All right. Looks like we're now live for the December AMA. So I've already got a few questions here, some pretty uh, complex philosophical questions. It'll probably take me a little bit of time, so that's good because that leaves other people a chance to ask their questions. Um, I'm going to remind everybody who's watching, I probably should do this at several points, that if you're asking a whole bunch of questions, I'm going to answer one of them and then move on to some other viewer. You don't need to ask a question more than once to get it into the queue. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's uh, sort of like wasting everybody's space. Um, if I, do, if I don't get to your question, it's not the end of the world. I get a lot of questions in here, especially towards the middle to the end part of these things. So uh, Per Obatsion says, do you have a position on mind-body dualism? Um, I mean, kind of a position. I mean, it's not, it's not an area that I do a lot of work on, and I don't usually think of like, you know, my position as like, what is your position on this topic and this topic and this topic, putting things together as if it's a Wikipedia article or something like that. Um, I would say that, that, you know, I tend to view things in terms of there being something distinct that we're not reducible to our bodies. Um, but you know, you can, you can have that sort of view without going into like super hardcore dualism a la Descartes or something like that. Um, and I, you know, I, I would say I, I incline towards the view that bodies and materiality are quite important, that the relationship between whatever we're calling mind or soul or spirit and bodies is not a simple juncture but actually quite complex. Even Descartes, you know, talks about this in his correspondence with uh, Princess Elizabeth and with a few other people as well, that um, it's, not, it's not something nice and, and simple the way that textbooks often present it or the way that I think some philosophers would like it to be. And that's really about all I, I have to say on it. Um, I, I'm, you know, rather skeptical of AI projects that think that we're going to you know, reproduce consciousness or, or, or something like that. But no, I don't know. There's, there's a lot more to be said about that. Uh, Johan says, how would thinkers like Maurice Blondel, Gabriel Marcel, Henri de Lubeck respond to Charles Taylor's ideas of the buffered self and the imminent frame? So the buffered self is the idea that, you know, we're less permeable to things transcending our, ourselves, that we, we tend to be more isolated. I, you know, all of those are thinkers who are writing in modernity. So, I mean, this is, this is a theme that um, Blondell and, and, and Marcel talk about quite a bit, but they don't use Taylor's uh, language. So if you look at their, their works, they, they think that not being able, so like think about Marcel's notion of, availability or disponibilite, right? Or Blondell's notion of, of charity. Um, it's, a, it's a capacity to be open to things while actually still re remaining integral yourself. You don't want to just like be so open to things that everything takes you over and transforms you into another, another clone of itself. Um, I, you know, I'm very leery of these big generalizations about modernity that the modern self is like this. I think there's multiple modern selves. So I've never, I've never really bought into those um, sorts of sorts of generalizations, you know, any more than I've bought into like Marshall McLuhan. All right. Uh, Lyra asks, what can philosophy teach us about dealing with physical pain? Philosophy is such nothing. Philosophies, a lot of things. So, this is where you actually want to drill down and ask what philosophical traditions can be useful for dealing with physical pain. And what does dealing with physical pain mean? It could mean, you know, stop hitting yourself in the hammer, in the head with the hammer so that you don't have pain, right? Stop doing certain things or start doing certain things that are going to make your body have less pain. Um, but it can also be like adjusting one's mindset to, to things. And so there's a lot to be said in ancient uh, philosophy, particularly Stoicism, what we have of Epicureanism. Um, I think there's a lot there in the, the, the Middle Platonist tradition as represented by somebody like Plutarch. 
the Aristotelians, you know, help us to formulate how, how to understand these things. So, you know, and then this idea, these ideas run throughout the, the history of philosophy, many of whom, you know, like Christian thinkers and early modern thinkers are very conversant with some parts of ancient philosophy and also live in a time when analgesics are not readily available. And so they, they, you know, talk about it quite a bit. So I would say it's, it's not what philosophy can do for you, you know, capital P general thing. It's, it's particular schools that you want to look at. And as a matter of fact, there was actually in Sto stoicism today, um, Donald Robertson and me and, and one other person, we actually went on a podcast and did interviews about how to deal with chronic pain and what stoicism would have to uh, contribute to it. So, all right, alternative S, what makes a real philosopher in today's world? When is it right for one to call themselves with that title? There's no answer to that. I mean, anybody can call themselves a philosopher if they want to, and a lot of people do. And basically they mean that they, you know, like to generalize or, you know, they have a uh, tendency towards opining on things. Um, it's, it, there is no single answer to that sort of thing. And I think anybody who tries to provide you with one is probably full of crap. Um, you probably want to look at who's actually considered to be, you know, um, as a matter of fact, here's a, here's a better thing. Don't think of it in terms of an on-off switch. Think of it like somebody's more philosophical, somebody's less philosophical, right? That might be helpful for you. But there aren't any, any absolute criteria. There's no agreed-upon definition of philosophy. This is something I talk about in my, my philosophy classes at the very start because otherwise people are going to go to, the, you know, like the Oxford English Dictionary says philosophy, blah, 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 and then you're like, don't rely on dictionaries. <laughs> you know, it's not going to help you much in, in philosophy. Um, I think that, you know, you can call yourself by that title if you think that you're doing something that answers to the name of, of philosophy, and other people can dispute that if they want to. Uh, Sean asks, A.J. Ayer once said the reason he was not brilliant at philosophy was because he did not know math. How important do you think mathematical skill is for being a great philosopher? I don't think it's particularly important. It probably depends on what kind of philosophy you're doing, right? If you're doing, if you're trying to do work in the philosophy of mathematics or foundations of logic, you probably need to, un it's not knowing math like being able to compute or something like that. It's understanding the theories behind it. Um, so, you know, being able to understand how to put together proofs for things and, and what constitutes it a good proof. Um, but, you know, air was writing in a time and a milieu in which philosophy was quite enamored of mathematics. And so he probably had a little bit of an inferiority complex that he didn't need to have in, in relation to it. Um, Dale says, do I have any thoughts on the practice of meditation and mindfulness in today's society? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I'm teaching a class next semester from Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design called Philosophy, Mindfulness, and Life. So what we can say is that meditation and mindfulness can be done in a number of different ways, that it's not simply an Eastern or non-Western practice it's something that you also find, I mean, Stoics called it prosoche, right? Attentiveness. Um, so it's something that's used quite a bit in, in a number of different philosophical and wisdom traditions. I would say that a lot of what, what gets called mindfulness today is kind of watered down stuff. And they're trying to, you know, strip it of its, they're usually getting it from Buddhism, and they try to strip it of its, its uh, religious commitments so that it can be more general, but you lose something in the process. That said, you know, some of the activities can be quite useful, but I think that mindfulness and meditation tend to produce their greatest dividends when they're within a substantive framework, right? So, you know, you can say the same thing about um, techniques that are drawn into psychotherapy in other ways, like reframing exercises. I think they work better when they're in a uh, more philosophical or religious framework, but, you know, maybe I'm wrong about that. Uh, it's just my observations. I would say there's a lot of uh, people out there peddling garbage mindfulness and meditation, um, but there's a lot of people out there peddling garbage everything, you know. There's 
there's a, you know, you, you tell whether something is effective by seeing whether it provides you with substantive guidance for, for your life that actually pays off. So the um, business coach slash self-help kind of embrace of ideas from meditation or mindfulness, sometimes that can be good, but you often want to go beyond just, just that. All right, uh, CS, I find it depressing how much we generally forget of what we've read. Any thoughts on this? I used to get depressed about that sort of stuff, and, and now I don't. And I think that what happened in the process is that there's, there's two things. One is that um, if you're reading and you're not like speed reading, like the kind of person who's trying to like get in the books and, and like have mastered this and mastered that, but you're actually like reading um, – sort of like for the long term, reading slowly, thinking about what you're doing, you'll be surprised how much of the stuff that you think that you've forgotten when it's, when it's properly reawakened in your mind will, will come back to you eventually. And you'll be like, holy crap, I, uh, I, th I thought I'd totally forgotten about that, but now I realize that this is the case. And another thing that you can say is you need to read a lot, right? Um, the more that you read, just like the, you know, if you want to become a good writer, write a lot. If you want to become a good reader, read a lot and read stuff that challenges you. Um, but don't be some sort of, you know, snobbish elitist about it who, you know, only reads the tough modernist novels. It's okay to read, you know, sci-fi and fantasy. And, and, uh, I don't know if you're into romance novels, I don't read that, that, but People are, 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 you know, people like those. They could be good too, I suppose, right? Um, and so you could, you could retain quite a bit. And then, you know, I would say the other thing that probably for me changed is as you go on through life and you accumulate more and more of this stuff in your memory banks that isn't getting, you know, accessed all that often, you reach a point where you're like, well, I don't remember everything. And maybe I don't even remember 10% of what I've read, but that's still pretty good. You know, that's still, it's, it's not nothing. It's, I don't have to have ideal, you know, uh, memory or anything like that, like they have on these characters on TV who are complete fictions, right? <laughs> um, I don't need anything like that in order to be okay. You know, I'll, I'll actually tell you a funny thing that somebody said about me in grad school that I've, I've said here before. Um, I would often like be like, oh yeah, that's, that's in this book here and all that. And, and one of my friends said, yeah, Greg hasn't really read a lot. He's not well read in that sense, but what he, what he, you know, what he has read, he's actually paid close attention to. So that was kind of nice. All right. Uh, Jeff Bim, well, I can't, Bimble, Benable, do I consider psychoanalysts particularly young to be philosophers? What, if anything, do you think young has to offer? I'm not into young. Um, I think psychoanalysts have some things to offer, but I'm not, I'm not a, a fan of Jung. So uh, I think Jung is one of those things, sort of like William Reich, either you're into him or you're not. And I've always found Jung to be rather implausible and, you know, all of this archetype stuff is kind of a neat bow to put everything into. And, and I, I've, you know, quite frankly, not by, been particularly impressed by the people who are influenced by Jung by comparison to those who are influenced by um, Freud and his, you know, other early psychoanalyst school people and Lacan and Kohut and people like, like that. Um, and, you know, is, is psychoanalysis a philosophy? Um, it's, it's philosophical adjacent. It's doing something different. The idea is to actually heal people. To fix people. So, I mean, you could say it's kind of like a philosophy of life. The pretensions to being scientific, I think, are, have been blown out of the water. Um, and, and that goes both for Freud and for Jung and for other offshoots as well. But it doesn't necessarily have to be scientific to be usable for psychotherapy or um, for other purposes. But I think there's a practical purpose involved in psychoanalysis when it's not just dilettantism, right? Um, that, you know, that doesn't make it not philosophy, but it makes it very different than a lot of philosophy. I'm somebody who's willing to extend the term philosophy quite broadly to encompass way more than what we typically bundle under the discipline's name in academics. 
Um, and, you know, um, what does psychoanalysis have to offer? Theories about the human self and its development and its relations to others through culture, um, understandings of traumas, understandings of ways things go, go wrong. I would say those are, those are often quite helpful and can be great supplements for virtue ethics. Um, but you always got to be careful. You're not, you're not just like cobbling two things together. You've got to be um, you got to be dialectical in the way you approach it, meaning you got to see, got to sift things out and see what actually works. So like, you know, the Oedipus complex, I think that was nonsense from the start. <laughs> you, know, you read something like that and you're like, how did so many people get taken in by this, this idea, you know? Um, but there's a lot of other things that, that could be quite useful. So, yeah. All right. Let's move on to... The next, um, Lord Roku, we're reading Atheism and Christianity from Ernst Bloch in our philosophy class. Are you familiar with him? Not familiar. Um, I, I remember reading him back in grad school, but I don't even remember what I read. So no. Zeno of Alea, can suffering be overcome? Um, I don't know what you'd mean by, by overcome. Um, you can certainly find ways to deal with suffering, but if you mean like, can you banish suffering from human existence? Probably not. Uh, Eric Ritzenzahl, what is hermeneutics? Interpretation, you know, that's, that's what it essentially means, interpretation of signs. Um, there's a number of disciplines that are connected with it. Richard Elliott, how important is it to have a goal or purpose when tackling philosophy or anything, I guess? Um... I mean, you, you, you've always got some goals or purposes. Otherwise, you, you wouldn't be in an, in an, engaging in an intentional action. I guess the question would be whether they align with the activity of studying philosophy. And you could have a lot of different goals or purposes. Some of them could be kind of extrinsic to the discipline, but they might provoke you to, to learn. Like you could be, I want to become a rich, famous philosopher, which is a not going to happen most likely, right? So I got to study the history of philosophy and I'll write the ultimate book. I mean, that, that could lead you into studying, right? Uh, you could also be like, people have been calling me stupid. I'm going to show them I, I'm, that I'm not stupid. I can understand Kant or, you know, Hegel or whoever. Uh, that, that could be uh, a goal or a purpose. Um, I, I think you probably have a number of different goals or purposes. And we, as, as human beings, we're, we're these messy things that have a number of different um, things going on within ourselves that, that aren't always usually perfectly aligned. So you might have goals or purposes that you don't, don't even realize, you know, like maybe you're studying philosophy without realizing that it could be helpful for you to make sense out of your, your existence and your relationships and have better emotional responses. And that only comes to light as you're reading it and you're like, holy crap, this, this is useful for that. So, and I don't know that you have to have the same goal or purpose over time either. It could, it could change. There's Mark. Uh, <clears throat> good to see you here. Um, is there any thinker I would never teach on no matter how much I was offered? I guess you're imagining like, like money, right? Um, I don't think so. I mean, there's, there's teaching in the sense of like, explaining the ideas and then saying, well, here you go. Here's what they're actually saying. Now you make a judgment about whether you think this is good or not. You know, and I teach people who I disagree with all the time, you know, prime example of that is Ayn Rand and ethics classes. Um, not only do I think that Ayn Rand is a philosopher, but definitely a third rate philosopher who gets the history of philosophy wrong and, um, you know, most of the people that I've known that are into Rand are kind of um, kind of jokes as far as philosophy goes. Um, but I teach her because I think it's it's useful for my students to engage with somebody who has incredible cultural importance, not only now inside the USA, but also in a world sense. They're reading her in in uh, Brazil, apparently. Um, and you know it's good to know what's 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 um, off base or wrong, right? Uh, to be able to identify those weak points. I also teach Kant, and I'm not a Kantian, 
um, although Kant is considered far more respectable, right? Is there anybody who I just simply would not teach? Um, I can't think of a, a, a person who would, would come to mind, but, you know, there's, there's the prioritization thing. You know, people are always like, why don't you have videos on Spinoza? Because I don't teach Spinoza in my classes. Um, I have taught Spinoza in the past. I just don't, you know, I don't find him that productive to teach undergrads. Um, and I, I don't, you know, compared to many other philosophers, I don't find him all that, that interesting. Um, and, you know, there's nothing, it's not like I've got anything against Spinoza, but we've got limited time. So I just don't, I never get around to it. I've got video, uh, core concept videos, uh, sitting on my desktop on Max Stirner, uh, more on Pascal, um, Schopenhauer, just haven't gotten to him, you know? Um, <clears throat> everything's a matter of priorities, I would say. All right. Um, let's see here. Robert Sims, who was the thinker you recommended who fuses Aquinas and continental thought? I believe he was a Christian. I don't know. I, I don't, <laughs> where did I, uh, there, that could answer a whole bunch of people. I don't know who, who um, we're talking about here. I mean, there's a whole bunch of continental Thomists who would include Etienne Gilson and Jacques Maritain and Bruno de Solage and, uh, you know, Antonin Sertillange and pretty much all these French and German Thomists would be considered continental, wouldn't they? Um, so I, I have no idea which, like, of the many videos, I've shot, like, 1800 videos at this point i have no idea which one you're maybe referencing so uh but there's a ton of continental thomists out there so all right zeno what do you think of nietzsche's idea of the will to power as compares to schopenhauer's will i mean what do i think about it um i think it's great <laughs> you know, it's a nice idea <laughs> i'm not sure what you're asking there um so let me move on to the next one Alternative, let's say I read some noteworthy person's opinion on an issue I never thought about, and I agree with that opinion and make it mine. What do we do if that happens too often and we feel inauthentic? Oh, okay. Um, I guess you got a couple options there. You could realize that most of our ideas are actually derived from other people, but that we do, you know, the process of applying them and reinterpreting them. And that's often as close to, I mean, having your own ideas is not what makes you authentic. Um, responding in ways that represent, a, you know, coming out of yourself and a certain kind of consistency, I think that's more what makes you authentic. So you could be like, you know, an Aristotle got everything right person and still be authentic. And, you know, you're reading Aristotle all the time and you're just trying to, apply uh, a sometimes useful, sometimes totally outdated and antiquated set of ideas to, to late modern life. Um, you know, you could be authentic in doing that. I actually thought at one time when I was in grad school of writing a novel and it was going to be called The Aristotelian. It was going to be about a guy who um, like solved crimes and stuff like that and was, was essentially you know, relying on an Aristotelian framework to make sense out of the world. It's getting dark in here, so I got to turn on some more lights. Um, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really let that hold you back. The key is to, to you know, find ways to make the philosophies your own. To and a lot of that involves like going deeper into the philosophy. Um, Lokesh says. What do you think a prospective PhD student should be doing before putting in an application for a PhD? Well, first of all, you should decide whether you want to be a prospective PhD student after undergraduate or a master's student. Um, I actually think it's, it's foolish to go right to the PhD after um, the bachelor's because you're depriving yourself of the opportunity to study a lot of class, you know, in classes with professors. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've always thought that this track of I'm going to go straight to the PhD and that shows that I'm smart shows exactly the opposite, um, shows a kind of imprudence and impatience. But that said, if you, let's say you have a master's 
or let's say you're, you're a bachelor who's jumping straight into a PhD program. So there's a certain given packet that you have to have. You have letters of recommendation. So, you know, find some people that can write good letters of recommendation that you can rely upon to do it for you. You're going to have to write a um, statement, usually one to two pages about why you're applying, what you're interested in, um, why they should consider you, what your plans are. Um, you have to have your transcripts. Um, you'll have a writing sample usually, maybe one or two writing samples. Um, and that's, that, you know, that's usually the bulk of what you're doing. And these applications processes, just like um, applying for jobs in academia, they are essentially black boxes. You have no idea what's going to happen once that stuff leaves your hands and is on the table of a committee whose job is to go through and um, get rid of, you know, some right off the bat and then weigh some in different ways. Your, your application might appeal to somebody for purely idiosyncratic reasons, may turn them off for that. I would say one of the things, so one of the things you should be doing is like getting ready for rejection and rejection that doesn't have anything to do with you, you know, um, and also opening yourself to the possibility of, cool things happening that also may have nothing to do with your own merits, you know? Um, but the other thing that you can do is like, look at the programs and see who's teaching there. If you want to study with those people, what their emphases are. If you have the ability to get um, background information on what's actually happening in the departments, that can be very useful. One of the places I applied to, I applied to 10 different graduate schools this was in 1994 when I was applying and I got accepted at almost all of them. Um, Marquette lost my letters of recommendation and then didn't bother to tell me cause they were such a mess over there. And I, I adjust her over there cause they're 12 blocks down, down that way. Um, and then, you know, I, t I told that to the chair when I ran into him at a coffee house and he was pissed <laughs> at the incompetence of their, their people, uh, especially when he saw my GRE scores because I'd maxed one section. Um, DePaul wrote me back and said, DePaul's in Chicago, right? They're a major continental school now. They were at that time split between analytic and continental. They had a big battle and the, the analytics said, screw you, we're out of here. And they wrote me back and they said, we don't have enough professors to have a PhD program at this point in time. So we're not accepting any applications from anybody this year. So things like that will happen, you know. Um, other places will, you know, accept you but won't give you any funding or they, they'll take forever to get back to you because academics are, are not good at, at handling that sort of administrative work, you know. All right, uh, aspiring holistic sage. I was wondering what got, I was curious what got you interested in philosophy. So I was interested in philosophy before I knew it was philosophy. I was always interested in, you know, topics of uh, what we would call ethics and metaphysics and epistemology and aesthetics, you know, without, without really having much of a, a background in that. Um, not being introduced to it in a formal way. And I actually did take a philosophy class in high school, which sucked. It was terrible. It was basically memorize this, memorize this. We did, we used a, a textbook that was by Mar, uh, Marvin or Martin Gardner, who was a writer for Scientific American. It wasn't very good. Um, and then I had another class in high school. I've told this story many times. Mr. Lorenzo, one of my favorite teachers, was a substitute. He was teaching sacraments. So he said, I'm going to teach you about Augustine, which means I need to teach you about Plato and Aristotle first. So we spent half the semester on Plato and Aristotle. And he taught in a philosophical way, you know. And then, you know, when I was in the Army, um, you know, we'd get into all sorts of discussions and arguments about things that had philosophical weight to them. Uh, especially since we're doing a lot of hurry up and wait. And there were some pretty intelligent guys in my unit, a lot of really dumb guys too. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I picked, I remember picking up a book and I don't even remember who wrote the book, but it wasn't, you know, it was sort of like an overview of, of philosophical stuff. And then the other thing that was really key was I got out of the army and I was, um, I was working in a restaurant and I would read stuff that was kind of philosophical. 
um, like, you know, game, infinite and finite games, that, that book. I also read the um, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance and things like that. But then I got to, uh, to college because I decided I didn't want to be working in restaurants anymore and not earning very much. And um, my mom's boyfriend told me to declare a major right away. So I declared philosophy because I was like, philosophy sounds cool. And I just kept taking philosophy classes and I liked the stuff. And, um, you know, I also liked literature and, and history and the humanities writ large. And I also majored in mathematics um, in part because I love the theory involved. And, uh, you know, I just kind of wandered into it haphazardly. There wasn't any, there wasn't any like moment when I, you know, picked up this book and, and the way a lot of people tell their origin stories. This is a bunch of random things, I guess you could say. All right. Um, useless projects. What made me want to create more Albert Camus content? I just wanted to say I really enjoy them. Happy you made new ones. Uh, you know, I was trying to follow through on a commitment that I'd made. I la Last time that I taught existentialism, uh, for my Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design students, I shot a series of videos on Camus' Myth of Sisyphus, core concept videos, and I didn't get to shooting all of the ones that I had scheduled because I ran out of time. And so I was like, well, I got to shoot these sooner or later, teaching it again this semester. My class is just finishing up with Camus. Um, let's see, we're on Saturday. They're finishing up tomorrow. So I needed to have those videos for them. And that's what made me come back to it. I, I still have more I have to shoot on Myth of Sis Sisyphus to cover all of the topics in it. And I'll probably put together a online class that people can um, uh, purchase uh, in my Teachable uh, Study with Sadler Academy, just on, on you know, uh, Camus' Myth of Sisyphus. And I'll probably do some of his other works as well. I want to do The Rebel down the line and Letters to a German Friend and quite a few other things. So I, I think he's actually a, a great thinker. Um, he poses some really important problems. I don't agree with him on some of the um, positions that he takes, but I, you know, I like him. So right. Ryan, I like to look at things <clears throat> in terms of spectrums. I started doing this because of being so interested in political theory. Is this a good way to look at different subjects, spectrums, as opposed to like on off, like either it is or it isn't? Yeah, it's it's a good way to look at a lot of things. Some things really are either it is this or it is isn't this. But I think there's there's a lot of things where people assume that matters are a lot more binary than they are, rather than being being on a spectrum. You know, like goodness, for example, right? Goodness is, uh, it's not like you cross a threshold and suddenly become good. You know? And there's good for different things too. So we can say there's multiple spectrums going off in different ways. Alternative, how do you deal with difficult to understand books? Um, I don't know. I just keep plowing at them, I guess. I'm not a good person to ask about that because almost nothing that I would say about what I do is, is going to be all that helpful for other people. Um, there's a lot of people who are like, oh, you should try out this method or this source. If, if I have trouble reading something, I just read it again you know? <laughs> and keep reading it. And at a certain point, I can be like, well, I'm not going to figure this out. And it could be either because the book is is actually, when you get down to it, incoherent or gibberish, or it could be because it's just making, you know, there's too many things that I don't know the reference to, and I'm not going to take the time to look them up. Or it could be that it's actually beyond me. Um, but I, I find that, uh, you know, so a great example is, is uh, here, I've got this down on the floor. So, you know, all of you know, I've been doing the, half hour Hegel videos, right? And that's the Phenomenology of Spirit, which by the way, I don't recommend is the first book of Hegel that you read. I don't know why people always want to jump into that when if you really want to understand Hegel, you want to start out with um, some of his lectures where he actually names the names and tells you what, he, what he's talking about instead of all these tangential references. Um, so you want to look at his like lectures on the philosophy of history or lectures on the history of philosophy, or you could even like read his aesthetics or, you know, philosophy of religion or whatever. Um, but 
you know, there's, there's some days where I'm getting ready to shoot. You can see my video equipment in the back, right? The tripod and cameras and the truck board. And there's, there's a camera and I, you know, I'm going through paragraphs of this and I'm like, okay, I think I have a good idea what the hell's going on here. Right? And I think I've got some ideas about what I'm going to say. And then I start writing on the truck board. And then sometimes I get in front of the chalkboard board and I'm like, it's not happening today. I, I just lost my, my understanding. There's, there's some days where this is, is impenetrable to me. And there's other days when it's not. And that's the way it is, I think, for most people. Um, so there is one actionable bit of advice. If, if, you, think, if you think that the, the book is too difficult for you at, at a given time, maybe put it down and come back to it another time and see whether you have the same experience or not. So Jamie Brent, opinion on Kabbalah. I have no opinion on Kabbalah. Um, I don't really care about it. Uh, Noazia, what do you think of Nietzsche's critique of Stoicism? I did a whole video on that. You can watch that video and see what I think. Um, Eric says, what's your view on the idea of imminence? I don't have a view on the idea of imminence. <laughs> you know, these, these, some of these things are a little bit too, like, uh, vague. Uh, I have no idea what you're asking about. Um, let's see here. Made of clay been trying to understand Quentin Skinner's liberal conception of freedom as non-domination and Republican freedom as the ability to act on this freedom. I keep getting confused between the two because it's hard to find good examples that differentiate between the two. I haven't read Skinner for years. I was mostly reading him when I was doing a lot of work on Hobbes, so I can't really help you out on there. I'm doing a lot of uh, punting right now. All right, Noe says... Um, what do you think of a law prohibiting or limiting the recording of a police operations like the one being passed in France? So that's, that's one I can talk about. I think that those are terrible laws. I think that the only reason to enact those is to protect the police. And the question that we can ask is, are, do the police already have enough protection? I don't know about France. Um, I suspect they probably do in France. I can tell you that we ha they have way more protection than they need here in the United States, that we need way more transparency and way more accountability of police. And we also need way more, uh, if the cops want to say, oh, it's just a few bad apples, well, they better come down hard on those bad apples because otherwise, you know, with the metaphor, few bad apples spoil the bunch, right? So I, I think personally that, um, these these laws attempting to protect the police officers are really uh, just catering towards the use of force. It's a, it's a way of, of trying to have a, a citizenry who will be easily intimidated. Um, and we have way too many laws like that here in the United States already. So many things that, that tip the, the balance towards um, the police and whoever happens to be in charge at the time. So... All right, Mark, do you see human nature as inherently self-interest that needs to be restrained for people to get along, or on the other hand, basically good and cooperative? Yes, both. <laughs> see, I don't see human nature you know, in this sort of binary, it's either this or it's this. I mean, it's, human nature is really, really complicated. You know, there's a lot of moving parts, in, and we have both of these motifs you know, in, involved. And, and some people, they're, you know, it's more expressed. And then in some cultures, uh, other parts are more expressed. So, yeah. Um, all right. Let's see if we can find somebody I haven't taken already. Um, well, the first one like that is asking about Zizek. What do I think about Zizek? I'm not, I'm not, at this point in time, I'm very uninterested in Zizek. Uh, you know, I, I started reading his stuff in I think that over time, his stuff has is, is gotten sort of like with Derrida, you know, starts out very rigorous. Eventually, you're like, is this worth the time for me to read? Probably not, you know. So I think, I think he's certainly made himself into a celebrity. But, you know, I, I, every time that he comes out with a new book, I'm like, do I want to spend the time to, to read this? Or do I want to read any one of the many other things that I, I could read? Um. Anthony says, thoughts on Brad Gregory's The Unintended Reformation. Haven't read it. So, uh, Campar, how do you read material from people you really disagree with? Let's say Mein Kampf. I just can't. I mean, I do read Mein Kampf to see what, what um, Hitler had to say, and I read other um, 
far right and, and authoritarian and, and frankly fascist or national socialist or integral nationalist figures. And I've been doing that for years and years and years because I want to understand um, you know, what, what they actually thought, which often, and why it could be appealing. It, it often tends to be quite a bit more sophisticated than the caricatures that we give of it. But then you can also like see where the, the uh, mistaken assumptions are and where the, you know, um, problems arise and where, you know, where it's sort of a slide into evil. Um, how do you read people from who you'd really disagree with? I don't know. Um, Maybe some people can't. I know that there's a lot of people who think that you really basically only do philosophy by reading people that, that you align with, and you're supposed to read around until you find the people that you do agree with. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of people who get into stoicism this way, and it, it tends to be a sort of superficial attachment because they read a few things and they're like, yeah, man, this is exactly what I think. And then they, if they'd read further, they'd be like, no, Epictetus doesn't agree with you on a lot of stuff. And... Seneca would say that you're, you're off base on this. You know, the books should challenge us. And sometimes books can challenge us towards the good, you know, like when you read Boethius, for example, somebody who I'm going to be shooting videos on this month, you know, and you work your way through the consolation of philosophy and try to figure out what, what the hell does he mean about, you know, eternity and fate and all this kind of stuff. The book challenges you. The book brings you into it. Augustine talks about this. Actually, Gabriel Marcel also talks about this as well, uh, the difference between problems and mysteries. Um, and there's other books that challenge you in, in other ways. They're sort of like assholes in the bar spouting their bullshit. And you can like say, that's bullshit, and punch them in the face and throw them out. Or you can like sit down and, and listen to them and see what they have to say and still be like, well, you're, you're still full of crap or you're, you're a terrible person or something like that. Um, but you might also, you know, see, see tendencies within yourself that, that connect up with that. So, all right. Austin says applied psychoanalysis provides results to certain people, particularly high trait openness and temperament. Insofar as the students, I don't think they can discover anything new. He cracked it open. Yeah, okay. You're talking about Jung. Um, I'll, I'll just take your word for that. I, I don't find Jung very interesting. Um, Rishi, with the rise of conspiracy theories like QAnon, it almost feels like some of us live in a different reality. I was wondering how you think philosophy could be used to help deal with these people. It can't. Um, you need other, other means rather than philosophy. Uh, many of them you should accept are unreachable at this point in time. Uh, you know, and, and what's dangerous is that we've got, there's always some lunatic fringes out there, um, but now we've got a big lunatic fringe. QAnon is like mental poison. And anybody who starts buying into that, they start buying into all sorts of other crazy nonsense as well, which makes them unhinged and irresponsible and, and dangerous, quite frankly. Um, and... You know what you can do is you can keep you can keep like asking them questions and reaching out to them, but you can, you've got to accept that most of these people are just not going to be reachable. What it'll take is some sort of crisis, you know, sort of like COVID deniers, right? All these Republican COVID deniers who are like, oh, I, I think it's a hoax and all that, and then they get it or their kid gets it, and they're like, I was so wrong about this, and you're like, what an asshole you are. You only changed your opinion because it directly affected you. You wouldn't bother to look at what all the other stuff had to say about it was. You were like in denial. And, you know, so it's still good that they changed their view, but it's not a really good reason to change their view that somehow they got bit in the ass by it. Or you can think about like gun nutters who are, you know, they, their kid kills themselves. And, you know, playing around with their, their unsecured gun, their one of 20 guns that should be in the safe that they blew all this money on that they could have been spending on, like getting their family out of debt or, you know, pursuing an education. And that suddenly they're like, now I see the light. And it's, it's perfectly legitimate to say, well, it's great that you see the light, but you're a shithead and you're still a shithead and you're going to be a shithead um, until you like adapt yourself to something that isn't just about your own. Uh, emotional needs and selfish interests and, and you know, wanting to be part of a, a club or ideology or be mean to other people. I think the QAnon stuff is, is like that. 
it's, you know, there's, there's a great article, and I don't remember who wrote it, but they were talking about it as a new religious movement. That is dead on. It is a religious movement. It is a, it is a sect. And you're not going to be able to, as an individual, reach a lot of people in that sect. What you can do is provide a place for them to go if they do come out of it. You know, sort of like what we do with cults. So, all right, uh, just skipped a bit. Let's see what we got. Um, do, do, do. Here we go. Um, Nausea 56, as somebody asks this every time, thoughts on Jordan Peterson. What is there more to say on Jordan Peterson? He... Uh, He's revealed himself as kind of a joke. People who buy into his stuff are kind of a joke at this point. Uh, he was quite popular for a while. The way that we often see these, these pop, you know, psychology figures rise. He tied in with a certain right-wing mentality. And uh, there we go. You know, I mean, what else is there to say? I've, I've said stuff about it many times. Um, Silmus. Seamus, maybe, Broderick. Are there any philosophies, philosophers that are per particularly pertinent to trauma recovery? Um, I mean, existentialism, you know, I would say can be helpful. There's nothing that's at, like directly relevant to it, unless there's like philosophy of trauma out there, which I don't know, you know, maybe, maybe there are some philosophers who are writing explicitly directly about this, but there's all sorts of people who are writing sort of in alignment with it, you know, it depends on what the trauma is coming from, I suppose. Um, you know, you could think about critical philosophers, um, whether they're feminist or anti-racist or stuff like that. There, there's often a lot of discussion of trauma in there. Um, but I, I think sometimes even like, it's not as if you can directly apply it, but you could think about, um, you know, like Aristotle, what he has to say in Nicomachean Ethics Book 7 about the difference between brutality and vice. And he uses as an example of that um, children who have been sexually abused. Uh, that was a problem even back then. And the things that it induces. So, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of people that might be useful. Um... Sean Hamill, as a Christian, do you think the spread of Christianity was based on complete historical contingency, or do you believe it was due to a divine plan? Why would it be one or the other? <laughs> I mean, if you actually think there's a providential ordering, it happens, at least the way that you know traditional Christian thought has, has talked about this, through contingent events. So, you know. All right. Uh, Gabriel, what are some good starting points in mindset to become politically educated in today's polarized society? Um, hmm, that's a, that's a good question. Politically educated. So, you know, it's good to have, I'd say political education would, would consist of a couple different things. One would be learning some history, right? Learning the history of where different um, political ideologies have come from and why they're attractive and not just recent stuff, but, you know, going back a ways and doing some comparative work as well. Um, political theory would also be good to learn about, you know, um, even if it's not directly applicable to the situation that you're in, it, it broadens your, your point of view and allows you to be able to, to think these things through. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much all that I've got to say about it. Um, Eric asked, do I view Deleuze as a kind of anarchist? Kind of anarchist is a good descriptor, yeah. Very suspicious of power structures, of the law, but realizes that we can't totally get by without them either. You know, a lot of people think of anarchists as like they want to get rid of all rule, and that's not, that's not always the case. I mean, anarchists are kind of a, a broad mixed group, right? Some of them want some of them want to replace coercive power relationships with um, power relationships that, that people could get behind that would be, you know, mutually beneficial or things like that. Um, I mean, Deleuze is not an anarchist in the sense of let's tear everything down or anything like that. 
uh, he, he engages a lot of recuperative projects in the history of ideas, you know. Um, this is a good one. Q says, thoughts on Sam Harris, Zizek Peterson require a bot in chat to automatically answer them. At this point, that would be quite useful. We could load in like, you know, the top 10 uh, thinkers that I always get asked about um, and, and I don't really care much about that that would that would be quite quite useful wouldn't it sorry says in all caps why are not generated new social scientific ideas today uh, who says there aren't <laughs> i mean there's 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 continually new stuff coming out um it's hard to stay on top of all of it because there's so many people working in the humanities but i i'm not sure why you would say there isn't anything being new um, alternative says we study the symposium at uni my professor seems to agree with everything but to me it seems like some people are meant to love and be loved and others don't what's your opinion on that so you couldn't agree with everything in the symposium because the characters disagree with each other um, to begin with maybe you mean that he agrees with everything Socrates and Diotima are saying um, some people are meant to to love and be loved and others not. Um, I mean, it depends on which person's uh, position you're taking in the symposium, right? If you're taking Aristophanes, then there is a match or mate out there for us, or at least a facsimile of them. If you're talking about, you know, what, what Socrates has to say and the ladder of, of loves, you're actually moving away from individuals towards more universal things that you fall in love with, and then you love others through that. Um, not everybody can do that. Um, if you're talking about Pausanias, you know, the there ought to be a law kind of guy, or the laws are actually kind of screwy, who only talks basically about, about um, uh, laws governing um, sex between men and boys. Um, he's already taking a very exclusive point of view, right? So, yeah. Thomas says, what kind of fictional literature do you recommend that's also philosophical, classical, modern, existential? Well, there are the existentialists, right? So Kafka is quite philosophical. Dostoevsky has characters arguing philosophy. Um, and, you know, speculative fiction is quite good for that sort of thing. Um, depending on who the author is, right? Some some have more, like Philip K. Dick or Ursula K. Le Guin or Octavia Butler, um, C.J. Chera. You know, those are examples of, of um, people who are really working out a lot of philosophical ideas. Frank Herbert, right? Um, maybe some aren't, the schlocky writers, you know, or they've got ideas that aren't, aren't particularly interesting or great but i mean this, the world of speculative fiction has tons and tons of stuff prohem is there any idea or thinking you think is understudied in philosophy literally thousands <laughs> so yeah and there's always going to be kind of a faddishness to things and we don't want to take who are in the academic journals or who are being taught in departments as an index of the value there's always people that are being overlooked um, doll liquor. Do you think, do I believe there's anywhere in particular in Heidegger's work where he misses the mark is false or proposed something you did significantly disagreed with? Yeah. Plenty of stuff in being in time, you know, the, uh, way in which he handles tradition and, um, the, you know, his, his deliberate decision to say that any sort of moral or ethical concerns are already sort of like putting, you know, blinders on. There he's in like complete opposition with somebody like Mark Shaler, who is a contemporary of his and just as good as Heidegger and just as important in the phenomenological movement. So, yeah. Thinker, what do you think of the teaching profession? Is it the proper route for someone who loves philosophy and is philosophically minded? Um, if you're talking about the academic teaching profession here in the United States, where we don't have people teaching philosophy in high school, uh, except in you know a few religious schools and in uh, as an elective in a few really well-funded public schools, and you're talking about the you know universities and colleges we have right now, 
this is not a great time to be trying to find jobs in academia. Places are cutting. Marquette University, just down the street, is firing 450 staff and faculty this semester. All the uh, uh, visiting assistant professors have been fired. They're going to start cutting into the departments now. Another one of the places that I teach, much smaller, Carthage College, fired 15 tenured professors over the summer with one month's advance warning. So, you know, should you should you try to get jobs in the academy? If you can get them and hold them, you're then that's great. The competition is incredibly stiff. Um, is it the proper route for someone who loves philosophy and is philosophically minded? There's no proper route. There's a whole bunch of routes, and you can decide what you think would, would work for you. Some people, even back when I was an undergraduate, it was common for people to come out of philosophy and then work for corporations as system analysts. There's all sorts of jobs that you can work with a uh, philosophy degree where you can actually, you know, put your mind to, to work and, and do some cool stuff, you know. So... I don't think, I mean, the teaching profession is great if you can get into it and you like teaching and you're good at teaching. If not, uh, it's probably going to suck for you, you know? So, all right. Um, Isaac, have you ever taught or considered teaching the works of the Frankfurt School? I have taught them when I was teaching uh, like the whole curriculum for a philosophy degree in Indiana State Prison. Um, I don't usually bring them in, not because I don't like them, but because we have limited time in in the classes that I teach. But I mean, I, I could do it. I don't know. I don't know that there's that much interest in it among students. So, Austin says, "How do rationalists find any firm ground in philosophy when nothing is intrinsically rational unless imposed by an observer? Wouldn't that be pragmatism?" I mean, how do you know that? <laughs> That's a huge assumption you're making there. Is, that seems like something you would want to have some sort of argument for rather than assuming everybody has buy-in on that. Um, I mean, the, the, the rationalists provide arguments for the positions that they take. You, know, you can find Descartes talking about that in the meditations and in object, you know, some of the objections and, and replies and stuff like that. Um, Anadi says, name some philosophical texts that might help in working through regret. Well, that's where Mach Shaler could be, could be useful or, you know, um, any of the other phenomenologists who, who look at the human emotions, Adrian Pepperzak, perhaps. Um, those, those could all be interesting lines to go down. You could also look at, you know, treatments of emotions in uh, earlier um, ancient philosophies like Aristotle or, you know, the Platonist tradition or the Stoic tradition, you know, sometimes the regrets that we have are not really that rational and we can work our way through them. So, all right. Uh, let's see. Fur with a lot of views. Sure. What should I be looking for in a piece of work of mine that I might submit as a writing sample? Just what I think is my best work. Um, well, you definitely want it to be what you think to be your best work, but you want to, you know, you want to pick it. If you've got a choice between like a writing you did on somebody really obscure that not too many people are familiar with and writings on, you know, thinkers or topics that, or problems that, that more people are probably going to know a little bit about and be interested in, I would submit the latter, right? Because you're more likely to get it read by people who think that, you know, it's, it's a topic, topic worth discussing. So I, I would, I would add that to it. Uh, Muhammad, can you recommend some workbook or anything around why is there something rather than nothing question? I mean, you know, Heidegger <laughs> brings that up a lot, right? Leibniz, um, you know, uh, any of the, the thinkers that, that talk about God creating things, they usually have some reason why they think God created things. Uh, that would be people. 
Uh, Dylan, what are your thoughts on psychedelics, especially now that some substances like uh, psilocybin might be used for therapeutic practices? I think therapeutic practices and you know philosophical stuff are two separate things. Um, I, I think that, so I'll say this, I think that, that people who are like into drugs for the sake of being into drugs are usually pretty boring people in my experience. Like I, I, and one of the things that was a drag about smoking pot was all the, all the friggin' potheads that, you know, pot will make you happy to just sit around and do nothing other than watch TV all day, you know? And I found that really boring when I was, when I was, uh, into stuff. I was more into smoking and drinking. You know, I liked uh, the taste and, and the effect of tobacco and I liked uh, drinking. I still drink every once in a while. I don't, I don't get drunk like I used to, but I'll have a, a drink every once in a while with my wife or friends. Um, you know, I enjoy the buzz that you get. I don't enjoy hangovers now that I'm older. Though, I can tell you that, um, you know, and, and, and I never did any, um, uh, hallucinogenics and never really wanted to because most of the people who would talk about, Oh, it's going to open your third eye, man, or, you know, show you reality or something like that. I never bought into that, that, that sort of line. I think it can, you know, it can make you see things in different ways, but um, I, I think that if you want to like understand reality, you do it through the old fashioned ways of working your ass off in terms of, you know, harnessing the powers of your mind. I mean, this is the, the objection, by the way, that, that practitioners, uh, uh, you know, of Hinduism and Buddhism and things like that made to Adels Huxley when he was making these arguments uh, back in, in the 20th century. Um, I think it's great if we can use, you know, ecstasy or, or hallucinogenics or stuff like that to help people deal with PTSD or things like that. But I, I don't think there's much philosophical use for the, these things, you know? So, all right. Um, let's see who else we've got. Rima, where do you think someone should start on Hussrol? Uh I, I mean, I always start students off with two things, Husserl's Cartesian Meditations, and his article that he wrote, I think it was for Encyclopedia Britannica, perhaps, on phenomenology. Um, I think those are good starting points. But I'm not a Husserl scholar. I mean, I actually wrote my, my, my master's thesis on Husserl and Dissocer and basically duplicated without realizing what Derrida had done in speech and phenomena. Um, but after that, I was like, that's enough Husserl for me. You know, I, I, I'll read him every once in a while. I've, t I've taught him occasionally, but I'm just not that into Husserl. So, um, <clears throat> let's see here. Sam C., thoughts on the idea you can't help people who won't help themselves? Um. Oftentimes that's used as a justification for not helping people because you don't know whether they'll help themselves or not. You probably need to, to try, but there are, there, I mean, there are a lot of cases where you can do all sorts of things for people and they will continue to like screw up their lives and lives of other people around them. I mean, you can help people against their will in some ways, like, you know, if they're suffering from an infection, you can give them antibiotics and not make it an option for them, but that's, that only gets you so far. Um, you, you really can't do, there's certain like thresholds you can't get past unless people want to buy into it. All right. Um, Giovanni, is Wittgenstein an important philosopher? You know, that's a really interesting question. I think the consensus is that he really was considered to be so in the 20th century and he helped out with certain things. As I've mentioned in my, my video on Wittgenstein, he would have been so much more powerful had he been better read uh, on his own part and not just read so selectively. Um, it was, it's interesting because somebody actually asked on Twitter, what is there in Wittgenstein's works that is a su substantive contribution to philosophy that you can't find in somebody else who didn't get it from Wittgenstein? And people put a whole bunch of different things and then other people would be like, that's there in this person. That's there in this person. 
I guess with Wittgenstein, it was somewhat like being in the right place at the right time and impressing the right people. Um, but I, I, I tend to think that um, he will certainly be talked about a lot, but he's not really as important of a philosopher as we, we thought he was. So I think, you know, by the end of the, the you know, this century, he probably won't be read that much. Um, all right, let's see. Do, do, do. Aaron Swanson, it's funny you said military service brought you to philosophy in a lot of ways. I, I didn't say that. Um, I, I, all I said was I... <laughs> I talked with guys and we'd talk about things that were broadly philosophical and I bought a book. <laughs> so military service <clears throat> did not bring me to philosophy. But he says, the same applies to me when I was in the army, which actually brought me to anarcho-communism. I'm sure he had very different experiences than, than I did. I'm, I'm glad that, you know, being in the army was helpful for you that way. Um, let's see here. Tell says... I was about to ask about Nietzsche. I haven't seen the video, but my impression is that he's a hammer who tried to destroy all myths. So his myth would prevail. Myth of the genius. I, I wouldn't, I mean, that's for me hearing that it, there's, I don't map that onto thinking about Nietzsche as a thinker at all. Um, so he didn't try to destroy all myths. As far as I can tell, he certainly, you know, philosophized to the hammer, but that doesn't mean he busted up everything. So Kiao says, I'm going to take philosophy ethics next semester. Any guidance how to make the class easier? Um, ethics can be taught in a variety of different ways. I don't know how your instructor is going to teach it. I, I guess you could say, you know, the, the same things that would apply to any class. Stay on top of the, the readings. Um, try to think about how you can apply this stuff that you're studying within the context of your own life. Um, but you know, I, I have no idea. There's so many different ways ethics gets taught that I don't know. I don't know what to, I, I could really say. Chris says you've mentioned before you have some interest in systems theory, or is it systems philosophy, novel in the history of philosophy with the rise of complexity science? I don't have an interest in systems theory. I have an interest in systems, which go which precede systems theory. Systems theory is a set of approaches. I'm not really interested in that. Um, I'm interested in all sorts of systems and in being systematic, but that's not the same thing as system theory. Um, Sir Sluggard, are there any fictional pieces that delves into philosophy that you enjoyed? Literally thousands, um, ranging from, <clears throat> you know, as I mentioned, Philip K. Dick and Ursula K. Le Guin. I'm rereading Dick's Martian time slip right now which is, you know, as awesome as when I first read it 15 years ago, maybe 15 years ago. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's literally thousands you could pick from. So uh, let's see. Made of clay. This is more of a what if question. If one were to see a police brutalizing a citizen, at what point would the officer lose their authority that a citizen could step in to stop them? As soon as they begin brutalizing. The very word brutalizing is, is revelatory there, right? Um, all right. Oh, it just jumped again. Let me see what we got here. Um, Renan says, I'm writing a paper as a dualism response to prison, Princess Elizabeth's Objection about interactionism. Any suggestion for responses from other philosophers other than Descartes himself? Um, responses to Princess Elizabeth. I don't know. Um, responses more broadly? I mean, Spinoza, Principles of Cartesian Philosophy, and then the Ethics is setting out one possible way to look at it. Um you know, the entire rationalist tradition from that point on was very interested in the mind-body relation. And, and the French authors in particular, you know, Merleau-Ponty, Maurice Merleau-Ponty actually had seminars on the um, connection between the mind and the body in Descartes, 
Man de Biran and Bergson. So this is this is a, a um, topic that that really you know people kept approaching over and over again. Um, let's see here. <laughs> so Renzo says, I have an irrational disdain for Kant that came from some fellow students. What's an engaging intro to him that might get me past my goofy disdain? Um, I don't know about intro to him. I, I suppose, do you mean like reading secondary works? Like you could read Honora O'Neill, you know, she's a great conscient of the 20th century. Um, I mean, when you read Kant stuff, I would say it's clear that he's, he's a, a great thinker. Um, we might not agree with what he's saying, but he's not stupid for what, what he's saying. He is kind of stupid at certain points, right? You know, like, you know when, he, when he's talking about um, in the morality of his time and he's like, oh, you know, this is terrible and this is terrible and all that. But, but there's, there's a grandeur to his thought that runs past that. And um, I don't know. I mean, you could take a look at, take a close look at the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals and then, and then read the metaphysics of morals. The meta, you know, focus on the metaphysical elements of virtue before going to the metaphysical elements of justice. It's really cool stuff. And again, you know, we don't have to necessarily like agree with his way of formulating things, but there's, there's something there, just like with Hume, right? Or Descartes, or a lot of these great thinkers, you don't have to, to agree with them to see that there's something worth studying there. Michael Anderson, do you like Schopenhauer? Yeah, I like Schopenhauer. He's an interesting guy. Um, I liked him well enough to take a Schopenhauer class as a postgraduate with European Graduate School when I was there as a visiting scholar and was given the opportunity to study with Wolfgang Schurmacher, the at that time president of the International Schopenhauer Society. So yeah, I like Schopenhauer. <laughs> you know, uh, he's not like in my top 10, I'd say. Uh, but, you know, he's, he's cool. Sire, I've heard some interpretations of Peterson as a pseudo-Stoic. Is that an accurate description for you? I wouldn't even bother trying to connect uh, uh, Peterson with Stoicism. Um, anybody who does doesn't know Stoicism. So, it's not, you know, it's just better to look at him as just a kind of traditionalist right-wing figure, you know. Um, basically, a, you know, a guy who... Uh, you know, went from being writing some some crazy stuff in his first book, drawing on all sorts of archetypal theory to, you know, being popular by giving lectures that were kind of, you know, on point sometimes and then weren't, got embraced by the right wing, and then basically became the old guy saying, get off of my lawn and pull your pants up. So, yeah, probably not worth, worth thinking about. Um, let's see here. Kevin says there will always be new ways to worship money. I guess so. Lenny Penny is eating animal meat unethical. If so, why? Um, I would say that eating meat that's coming from factory farming definitely is because of the horrific suffering it imposes, not only on the animals, but also on the workers. Um, I mean, I'm not a, a vegan or vegetarian myself. Um, we, we actually pay quite a bit for ethically sourced meat that we get from butcher box, uh, my wife and I, and, and she's, she's actually more, you know, uh, inclined towards, uh, veganism than, than I am. Um, I, I, I think you could say that the way in which we have allowed farming to devolve under late capitalism into factory farming is pretty horrific. Um, so yeah. Uh, Jordan Tahami, if you had to choose who is the most important philosopher of the 20th century, is it Heidegger or Wittgenstein? The most important philosopher of the 20th century. I mean, how do we de define importance? Um, I mean, I don't think it would be Heidegger or Wittgenstein. Um, man, I'd have to think about that. Uh, that's, a, that's a tough one. All right. Um, 
Eric says, uh, I'm currently reading the latter works of Foucault about ancient philosophy and having some trouble understanding the difference between ethics and the aesthetics of the self. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what you're asking me to do there. Um, I, I got to say that myself, as somebody who, who came to those works, having a grounding in ancient philosophy, some of the time I was like, come on, Foucault, you know, this, this is a good insight. I don't know, really buy you on this. Uh, and I think a lot of people buy it when they read Foucault, they like believe it hook, line and sinker. Um, you don't have to accept his, his categories uh, necessarily. Um, I mean, he's not using ethics in quite the same way as we do in ethics textbooks. Maybe that's what's, what's tripping you up, you know? Um, all right. Uh, Fua Dalden. Do you have any tips for someone who loves philosophy and the knowledge involved, but doesn't like sitting down for long periods of time to read, read in short periods, <laughs> uh, read in many short periods, get up and walk around once in a while. Uh, read by listening to audiobooks. Um, you, you often get different perspectives by hearing it rather than um, reading it. But, you know, that's, that's what you could do. Um, I, I don't know how you get around, like, getting the information. Um, so, yeah. Let's see here. Paul says, following your Hegel lectures... Susan Buck Morse's Hegel, Haiti, and Universal History is way cool. Have you read it? Have not read it. Sounds interesting, but um, haven't, haven't read it. Um, Andrea asks, why don't you debate Peterson or someone else from the IDW? Uh, it would be epic. I don't like debates. I think debates are, are usually pretty stupid, and I think that, that um, they're usually a waste of time. I agree with Etienne Gilson, who was in, you know, involved early on in the, the Christian philosophy debates, who said that people generally aren't changing their minds because of what's happening in debates. Dialogue is far better. Um, and then you have you know, these, these obnoxious characters who uh, just want to debate and basically have no interest in anything other than trying to win or you know, show other people up. I, I just don't see it as a particularly good use of my scarce resource of time. That said, if somebody wants me to debate people, they can, they can pay me, you know, if it's going to be drawing my time away from things I consider more valuable and, and, you know, making me work in a format that I think is particularly unproductive, they can, they can pay me for that. Just like people who want videos on a particular thinker can commission me to produce videos, you know. Um, Nestor, what are my thoughts on Leo Strauss? Interesting thinker. I don't buy a lot of what he has to say, but I do like to see what he has to say. I think that Straussians are usually, you know, not as good as, as Leo Strauss himself. Um, they come in a couple different flavors. I've met quite a few over the course of my career and have been impressed with very few of them. Um, so, you know, I guess that's all I have to say about Strauss. Um, let's see here. Aaron says, is Mach Shaler, who he said, in addition to Aristotle about regret and emotion and Adrian someone? So yeah, Mach Shaler. Um, uh, Adrian Pepperzak, uh, who I think has retired now from Loyola, uh, Dutch philosopher who's been here in the United States for a very long time, uh, did a lot of work on Hegel, on Levinas, on um, phenomenology in general. He's, he's somebody worth checking out. Um, do, do, do. Let's see here. Aaron asks about uh, Jean Mes Meslier. I've never read him, so I, I don't know. Um, let's see who I haven't read. Um, a lot of back and forth here going on. Hey, Bruce, nice to see you. Always good to talk to to him um who do we have that we haven't hit on yet because we're getting close to the the end time um hmm, badass cretin 
What kind of music do you listen to? What is your take on the philosophy of music? So philosophy of music is an area that I only know little bits and pieces about. You know, there's some interesting treatises in, in ancient and medieval philosophy, but we don't have a hell of a lot of that stuff. Um, Aristoxenos, <laughs> who was a student of Aristotle, bashed Aristotle, but wrote, wrote some interesting things. Um, Boethius and Augustine have interesting things to say about music, but a lot of it's not really that applicable to um, what we're dealing with in the present. Aristotle and Plato, of course, write about the different modes and what they can do. Um, my, you know, I, I listen to, you can say here, here's, here's my, my thing on music. I'm a classic metal head. So that means that I listen to a lot of heavy metal from the 1970s, 1980s, some of the proto metal stuff like Jimi Hendrix and cream and blue cheer. Um, and you know, some of those bands continuing on into the nineties and, and, and beyond, and then I also listen to some some genres of you know that, that include more recent bands like some some power metal, some some doom metal, and um, yeah, that's the, that's probably it. Um, so there's that whole range right there, and I know a lot about the history of heavy metal. I actually ha I have a uh, heavy a classic heavy metal class with my friend Scott Teruli, and we talk through the, these sorts of things and. You know, I go to concerts with my wife, who's who's also a good sport about that because she has a much wider range of music that she likes, but she also likes metal. And so um, there's that. But then I there's a lot of other things that I like as well, including some new wave, like I'm a big Duran Duran fan. Um, you know, some post-punk stuff like New Model Army. Uh, I got into alternative music in, in the uh, 90s. For a while, you know, I was I, I liked the grunge stuff. I played in in cover bands that you know covered Pearl Jam and Nirvana, and, you know, bands like that, Stone Temple Pilots. Um, and I like a lot of you know older stuff too. Like you know, I'm a big fan of Gordon Lightfoot, for example. Um, and I'm not sure where it came from. I know my dad was really he was really into music. And when I say my dad, I mean my adoptive dad who died when I was 11 and left a lot of records behind. He was into jazz and, um, you know, folk music. And, you know, he would go to music festivals. We would always go to Summerfest down here in Milwaukee. I'm pointing where, where the Summerfest grounds are from here. No, actually they're over there that, that way. Um, I, you know, like I remember seeing Paul Revere and the Raiders with him when I was a kid uh, and then going into, you know, the Ferris wheel and stuff like that. So I should probably do a uh, Sadler stories about that. And, you know, I've picked up other musical artists who I've liked uh, over, over the years, you know, um, some singer songwriters. So, so I listen to, you know, kind of a range. My wife exposes me to a lot of other kinds of music that I ordinarily wouldn't be listening to. Um, but I'm always coming back to classic metal. You know, that's that's my thing. So, all right. Uh, let's see here. Renzo asks about Eugene Thacker, but I haven't I haven't read Eugene Thacker. Um, Jamie, any ways or names you can point me to read about the value of aesthetic beauty? Yeah, I mean, there's like a whole whole bunch of philosophers. Um, Plato, you know, the symposium is about beauty, tokalon. Um, Aristotle, of course, has the poetics, but other discussions of tokalon in, in other places. Um, Plotinus is, is somebody who gets brought up a lot in, in um, aesthetics classes. Um, there's quite a few other thinkers in ancient times. Augustine, beauty plays a role in some of his thought. Um, really the whole Neoplatonic tradition, I would say it's important for them. Um, and then, you know, you can go all the way through into modern times, you know, Kant has the, the, the third critique in which he's trying to figure out what makes things beautiful. You know, German idealism is quite interested in all these romantic writers. So there's lots of, lots of people you could point to. Um, let's see here. 
do, do. Trying to see if there's anybody I haven't responded to at least once yet. Um, Galen, in your Aristotle video, you listen, you listen, see women, you list women, maybe you think are good Aristotle interpreters, thoughts on Martha Nussbaum. I've got mixed feelings about Martha Nussbaum. She's, she's a, you know, she's a good scholar on a lot of things. I don't always agree with her on stuff. I think she's very, I think she was very good at self-promotion and um, there's, there's other scholars who probably better deserve your time and attention than she does. Um, she also perjured herself deliberately in a court case years and years ago in a way that a classicist should have problems with, um, even for, you know, what, what to her seemed like a good cause. So, you know, she, she's, she's somebody who you, you have to engage um, but I don't, I don't, you know, uh, maybe I should hold her in higher regard. I, I, I'd say, you know, if I have to choose between her and Margaret Graver or Julianas or, you know, Gisela Stryker, or any of these others, Nancy Sherman, even uh, I'll take them, you know? So, all right. Uh, Nestor, what do you think about great book schools such as St. John's college? I think, you know, it's a good approach for some people. Um, I think that they, they're, they're interesting. Um, I don't think it's the only way to do great books. Obviously there's lots of other programs out there and I, I think that, you know, I, I've met quite a few people who have come out of the St. John's college, uh, either teaching or as students, and they all seem to have liked it quite a bit. It's just not a model that's readily available for most people. Um, so it's, it's almost like a, a utopia for, for the select lucky few, you know. Um, B, is Candlemas heavy, heavy enough? Is St. Vitus worthy of beatification? Um, I mean, heavy enough, sure, yeah. <laughs> um, they're not bands I listen to much. I mean, I've listened to, to both of them before, but they're not, they're not in my like big lists or anything. Um, Marina says, rise and fall of musical subcultures have similar patterns to rise and falls of various notions in society. They're quite Hegelian in that sense. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try to use uh, the bastardization of Hegelian dialectic, you know, with the thesis, antithesis, synthesis thing that people love to try to make sense of it. I think things are way more complicated than that. Michael, what philosophers do you recommend reading to get through an existential crisis? Well, I mean, you could read some existentialists, uh, but it could be all sorts of things. It, it, it really depends on what you're interested in and what your existential crisis is about. You know, um, some, some philosophers are going to have more to say to you. Some are, some people are helped out by reading William James and others. They're like, I can't stand this guy, you know? So there is, I don't know. There's not enough, there's not enough information there to, to really say. Um, let's see what else. Uh, gutter, gutter grown. Tell us about the stranger and the sophist. He is the sophist, right? I don't agree. He's Plato's actual opinion. Like some say, am I missing? something. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't really worry about whether he's representing Plato's actual opinion. I'd focus first on just getting, getting, that's a complicated dialogue, you know, <laughs> wrapping your head around, what the hell are these forms and how do they connect with each other? I would worry about that, that first, you know. Um, let's see. Andrea Marcovati, what do you think about social needs in the Gulag Archipelago? Seem to be a mix of historical stuff and unverifiable anecdotes to the point I think he might be overrated. Well, is the Gulag Ar Archipelago the only thing that social needs wrote? He also wrote One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, The First Circle. By the way, the first book I ever read of him, The First Circle, because my dad had it. A um, whole bunch of short stories, you know, uh, a number of other things. So do we do we judge him just by the Gulag Archipelago or do we judge his work as a whole? Um, you know, 
why do we read Solzhenitsyn? Do we read Solzhenitsyn just for the historical stuff? Or are we reading him for the asides and meditations on the human condition? I, I'd ask yourself that. Could be that some of it is bullshit and fabricated and that it still could be worth reading, you know? So, all right, uh, here we go. Let me find something to go out on. So Jim Guy, would you ever do a video on Albert Camus, The Rebel? It's his one work I could never find any information on. Um, I wouldn't do a video. I would do a series of videos. And it's, you know, it's one of those things waiting for me to find the time. Um, sort of like the question that Epic just asked that I answered so many times. Why don't you cover Arthur Schopenhauer? I haven't gotten to it yet. You know, for, for everybody who's like, why don't you do a video on this person? You can commission me or get people together to, to commission me to do videos on whoever the hell you want. But until then, I do things on my schedule and, you know, I do it when I can. And I'm generally shooting videos for my students, my academic students who have a priority over other, other uh, fans, right? Um, it's easy enough to get in touch with me. People have done it and commissioned me to shoot videos, you know? So that's, um, that's kind of a, a common thing here. Um, all right, let's find something else to go out on. Uh, do, do, do. Stephen Warren, what is the most beautiful work of philosophy you've read stylistically? That's interesting. Um, stylistically. I mean, if we think about who are the really great writers stylistically, it ain't Aristotle, you know, <laughs> and it's not Hegel. Um, I mean, Nietzsche is, especially when you read him in the German, is really good. Plato is really good. Um, Cicero, too. Um, I, I, I really like Cicero. Um, Descartes, you know, I'm going to pick, I'm going to pick Descartes, the meditations. When you read it in the French translation and you read it in the Latin, it's pretty brilliant stuff um, stylistically. So that's what I'm going to go out on. So, all right. Uh, good to see all of you. Didn't answer everybody's questions, but I answered quite a few. And uh, I'll be having another thing tomorrow on uh, political theory and application. We're still talking about the aftermath of the current election. And it's going out with a, uh, a whimper rather than a bang at this point in time. So maybe I'll see some of you there. Um, thanks, everybody who joined and had some questions. I'm going to be getting back to work. It's still, we're still in the semester and um, I'm going to get myself something to eat. So I will see you later on.